All right, it's six o'clock. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Emma, and I'm the Community Engagement Specialist here at the Filson. Thank you for joining us for tonight's program. Carol Peachy is a fine art photographer and psychotherapist whose photographic work explores cultural and natural heritage. She was awarded the Bluegrass Trust for Historic Preservation's Clay Lancaster Heritage Education Award, a Governor's Award for Innovative Programming, an Art Meets Activism grant from the Kentucky Foundation for Women. Her books are the recipients of multiple IPI and Forward Indies Awards. Her photographs have also appeared in Kentucky Bourbon Country, The Essential Travel Guide, and Lynn's work publishing Trilogies 2022. Please join me in welcoming Carol Peachy. A little shocking. So I'm used to wandering around, so this is gonna be a challenge for me to just stand in one place and talk to you all. <laughs> But thank you so much for coming this evening. It's really wonderful to see so many folks here. Um, this is a great topic, the Shakers and Shaker Village right outside of Danville. Um, and hopefully you'll learn a little bit, but mostly I want you to recognize that I'm not a historian, I'm a photographer. And so I will do my best to field whatever historical questions you have and give you some history background. But primarily my focus pun intended, uh, my focus was to try to bring to life through my images, through the light at the village, and through the material collections that they have, try to bring the Shaker values to life a little bit through those images. Um, so as I show you just a handful of images from my book, Shaker Made, which they have like three books for sale over there, um, which I'll be happy to sign. <laughs> um, but you can also get the book at, uh, well, you can go beg Carmichael's and you can also go to Shaker Village and pick up a bunch of them there. So that's a little bit of an introduction of, you know, what I'm gonna get going uh, into this evening. So I'll first start, just give you an overview. Well, let me ask this. How many of you all are familiar with the Shakers? So you don't need me to go on and on about the Shakers. <laughs> let me just suffice it to say that the Shakers were a Protestant uh, group that immigrated to the uh, United States, which was America, 250 years ago. And 250 years ago uh, this year, actually, um, they came over for religious freedom, as so many groups like the Quakers were at the time. Their official name was the United Believers in Christ's second appearing, but because of their style of worship, which included ecstatic dancing and singing, they were known to the world's people as the Shakers. Um, they established themselves as a community in Kentucky by 1806, and they were at Pleasant Hill by 1808. Uh, the Shaker theological beliefs provided the underpinnings for a unique utopian way of life, and believers practiced racial and gender equity in stark contrast to many of their neighbors, and they were persecuted for that both in New England and in Kentucky, um, but they persevered. Their efforts were always for the good of the community rather than just the individual and their commitment to creating heaven on earth. They are best known for sayings such as hands to work and hearts to God, and tis a gift to be simple. Work and worship were intrinsically linked for the Shakers, and that's one of the values that I really tried to capture in my images, is that it was not about the product, you know, just making a chair. It was really the process of making the chair that should have been, well, in their beliefs, you know, and in their values, the process of making the chair was the value. It should be for God, hands to work, hearts to God. And so it was the process. And because their process was about spirituality, it was divine, the product was beautiful almost as a byproduct. 
but it should be functional, shouldn't be fancy. Nonetheless, you know, over the millennia, well, not millennia, over the decades, you know, what we love about Shaker design is not just the simplicity, but somehow it speaks beyond just its divine. And I believe it is because of the emphasis on the process, not the product. So I tried to emulate that as a photographer. Okay, this is not about the end result. This is about the process of looking at this object or looking at this stairwell or looking at this exterior, you know, and trying to capture you know, what is emotional maybe, spiritual maybe, about what I'm looking at and see if I can get that emotion to come across in the photograph. Okay, um, is there anything else you need to know about the history? Uh, their values included function, which I've already spoken to, purity, perfection, integrity, inclusion, pacifism, and simplicity. Today, much of what we know about the material culture that they left behind as a result of their work was started by Edward uh, Deming Andrews collection. Some of you may be familiar with his uh, books. And an introduction by Thomas Merton, Kentucky's own, uh, that contained this now classic comment, which I love, about Shaker craftsmanship. He writes, the peculiar grace of a shaker chair is due to the fact that it was made by someone capable of believing that an angel might come and sit on it. Right. Uh, and and I, I believe that that's true. So my own interest, see, I, standing still is difficult for me. I just want to get out and walk. Uh, my own interest in the shakers is influenced by two elements. First, I grew up outside of Williamsburg, Virginia, in Richmond, Virginia, when it wasn't Six Flags over Colonial Williamsburg, <laughs> when it when they were still trying to figure out, they were still doing a lot of archaeological digs. There were still a lot of placards explaining what it is that you should be maybe looking at, and so it required imagination. And here I am, what a six-year-old looking at a placard that says, you know, on this site stood this, that, and the other, and I'm trying to imagine as a six-year-old without abstract thinking, I'm trying to imagine what that was. And I truly believe that that beginning for me is really why I focus on heritage sites. You know, my work as a photographer in Kentucky has been heritage sites. I've looked at agricultural heritage. Uh, I've looked at industrial heritage, primarily focused on uh, the bourbon distillery, and that was an accident, and that's a sidebar we won't get into. <laughs> um, and the domestic heritage, you know, historic homes. And so this this her this fascination with heritage, I really believe comes from my early childhood where I'm imagining. And so in my images, I'm also really interested in the presence that exists in absence. You know, if I walk into something that's already put together and done, I like it. But what really grabs me is I work, walk into a place where this could have been here and this was done there. And I'm interested in what is the story here? What is the narrative? And so that is also part of uh, my fascination um, with Shaker Village. The, the, the second thing about Shaker Village is James Lowry Coger, and I hope I'm saying his name right, was a Kentucky native, but he was one of the early curators of Colonial Williamsburg. And so when I first walked in as an adult, because I came here in the 70s, 1970s, when I first walked into Shaker Village, it was like, whoa, whoa, you know, I, it was just, it was a deja vu because it was set up in much the way that Coger had set up Colonial Williamsburg. So he was very, he came back to Kentucky and was very involved in uh, the restoration of Shaker Village and, and setting up Shaker Village. Um, all right, so moving on to a different slide. So I first began photographing Shaker Village in the 1970s. Not a lot of those images remain just because I moved around too much. And then again in the 1990s. And during that time, it was black and white film for me. 
I have some color slides, I have some color images, but no digital, of course. And this is one of the images from the 1990s. It was shot in black and white film. And at the time in Shaker Village, all the material culture, all the goods, so to speak, all the collections were out on display. You know, and I'm sure many of you remember this. You would just walk up to a room and there'd be a cord across and it would be set up the way a broom maker would be making brooms or a basket maker would be making baskets or boxes or whatever. And so, you know, this what we call living history was the way the collections were presented. Nowadays, we take a little bit better care of our collections and we have them in an actual collection. And one of the unique things about my opportunity to photograph at Shaker Village was the access to the collections because you walk up to a room now and there are lots of placards. My six-year-old self would be very happy. There are lots of placards around explaining what would happen here, but it's not laid out as though they just walked away to get lunch and they'll be back. Um, and so the access to the collections was wonderful. Now, what putting the collections in a museum-like uh, setting does is it protects the items, it protects the artifacts. What it does for a photographer is give you an empty room. <laughs> so I have a few images in the book from back in the day when it was set up, and this would be one of them, um, where you can see there were several uh, spinning wheels set up. Um, and a basket full of sheared wool, which, so the curator, Becky Souls, who wrote the introduction to my book, um, she was with me throughout. You know, she was the one who would say, well, what about this basket? Or what about that? I mean, really, truly, without the cooperation of Shaker Village and Becky Souls in particular, this book would not have come to pass because she was very brilliant and also very patient with me. And she would have a fit if she knew that that basket was there with um, actual lamb's wool in it. <laughs> it's not good for the basket, I take it. So again, I'm interested in absence and presence in my work. Um, Many people have photographed Shaker Village and they've done beautiful jobs. Um, and in fact, I was almost hesitant to do it at all because I thought, well, there've been so many good photographers that have done this, you know? So the access to the collections was one of the things that said, oh, okay, twist my arm. But the other thing was I wanted to see if I could evoke the emotions that I have when I walk around in the area in my images. And I thought, okay, so some of these images will be of interior spaces. Some of these images will be of actual artifacts. Um, some of them are of exterior spaces. Um, so this is an example in Center Family uh, up on the third floor. Of course, function, you know, they built these cabinets in, for specific purposes, um, but also just the beauty of the light in the space was what really, what really grabbed me. Uh, and I wanted to see if I could get a sense of them being there, even though they weren't. The Shaker sense of design has been explored and written about at length, so I won't go into that very much. What I hoped to do in my images, of course, was see if I could capture that my emotional response to their designs. Um, I kept in mind their values of all design needing to be functional and yet reflecting the belief that work is a form of worship. This was just primary for me. Presence and process is what I was really going for in the images. Uh, with the fundamental belief that all work should be done for the good of God, let's see if we can find that, you know, in their um, in their work. And so you have on the left, you know, the, everybody knows what a shaker box is. Um, what I was curious about is how they're actually built a little differently. The one on the bottom, the laps go to the left. And as you go up, the laps go to the right. And the top one has initials in it. 
And why that's significant is because the Shakers did not believe in taking individual credit for their work. So you weren't supposed to sign anything, and you also weren't supposed to be very possessive of anything. Yet, MKM got their initials on their little box there. The um, staircase to the right, most of you, if you've ever eaten at Shaker Village, are familiar with that view. I've wanted to take that image for 30 years. And there's always too many people in there and they're eating and they're having lemon pie and they're drinking coffee. And during the pandemic, there was nobody there. And they were doing a little restoration on the top, top floor at the trustee's house is where this is. Um, I was beside myself with excitement. I could take as much time and photograph as long as I wanted. And I was able to get the image that I've wanted for 30 years. Again, the shaker box with the light, you know, light metaphorically is spiritual, is related to the divine. And so I think that's why so many people who photograph Shaker Village, you know, are taken with the light on the interiors or on part of their collection. This was one of the first digital images I took with Becky. Becky says to me before I, I so I went down every Friday uh, and photographed and Becky would be prepared for me. And so she would say, well, what do you want to photograph today? And I don't even remember what's in the collection. So I'll say, well, I think I want to try to get photograph spirituality. And you could see her, you could hear her almost thinking like, what, how are we going to do that? But this is one of the first images that she set up for me. And I love it. It has the brethren's straw hat, work hat. It has that Thing that looks like an oil can well actually you turn it upside down and you put paint in it and then the paintbrush that's beside it you dip inside and you can paint with so I thought that's very clever as I'm standing there with my plastic thing trying to paint um, and then a chalkboard for the learning and the uh, children that were there these are very symbols of industry The presence of the Shakers along with the emotion of absence is important to me for several reasons. It's a sort of archaeology where one can project one's own understanding and histories, where one can witness another way of life and yet connect it to your own. A stack of hymnals, one open as if being used, and a pair of spectacles, all bathed in light, are all relevant today and yet so different. Leather binding, handwritten hymns, this is you, oh, the page to the right is handwritten. Um, hands, work done by hands that are no longer there, but you can imagine them turning the pages. You can imagine them writing. You can imagine them singing, right? And so we draw on our own life. You know, part of what I like about this absence is we draw on our own life to understand and imagine what was going on. Just as a little side, if you'll notice, the spectacles really only have one leg. Can you see that? The light has filled in the second one, I thought. Divine intervention. <laughs> all right, so the sisters' garb was not all that different from the attire of their times. Um, this is in the 1980s. This is Sister Mary Settle's bonnet, um, the last shaker at Pleasant Hill, which I think Zach probably wrote a little bit about, I thought, in, in his work. Um, and she gave this to a friend who was of the world's people. You know, since she was the last shaker, she was trying to hang on and, you know, get some of the uh, shaker uh industry out to the, the people's world. And so uh, the woman she gave it to stored it in a doll hairs box. And um, the doll hairs box gets more comment than the bonnet. <laughs> uh, the cape and the bonnet on the right would have been worn by any of the sisters. And so that's a different sort of bonnet is the straw bonnets that they made. They weren't, like I mentioned, to have personal property um, to avoid vanity, not to sign their handiwork and so forth. 
Yet there are examples of signed work throughout the collections. And these gloves have the initials of the woman that would have worn them. We don't know who that is. I might add that all of the things that I photographed are from Pleasant Hill. That, you know, when there's an exception to that, like I think there's a seed box in there that comes from the New England Shakers, but everything else comes from um, Pleasant Hill. So this was our attempt to express spirituality visually. The shoes, shoes seem to be very personal. They seem to really be symbolic of us. You know, they crinkle where our toes crinkle. You know, they spread where our toes spread. They wear down where our heels hit. Um, and these are silken sisters' shoes um, in the meeting house, which would have been the house of worship, a hymnal on the bench that they would have sat on. God's light upon the shoes that once danced and walked these floors. So I was constantly trying to find a way to express their spirituality visually, the dancing, the shaking, the singing. They're so ephemeral. It's kind of hard to get that on an image. And then one night after a shoot, one Friday after a shoot, obviously in the winter, I walked up to the graveyard and the setting sun gave me this image of the Shakers dancing, arms linked and moving on the trees. If you look at that closely, especially the far tree, it does look like they're holding and dancing in a circle like they would have at a meeting. Now, of course, it's the fence that goes around, but you know, why spoil it by knowing what it is? This is the meeting house light, which you aren't a photographer if you haven't tried to capture this. And this is a journal, which is a recounting of the day's work. And if you get up close and read it, which I was going to see if I could, gathered and made 19 jars of raspberry is the last line. You know, jam being one of the things and so forth and so on. Monday, put off washing. Well, who can't relate to that? <laughs> and so the journal, when you, when you, besides the fact that it's, you know, handwritten, when you read the things that they accomplished in a day, you're tired at the end of the page, right? I mean, it makes us, puts us to shame. So we'll move into more of the things from the collection that were related to industry, the baskets, I want you to notice that that basket in the center was the basket on the first image where I had the two chairs sitting there and the table, which was from the 1990s, where they had it out, where there it is pulled out from collections. Different types of baskets. I just loved how they did those little bitty weavings inside of the basket. It was like, oh, that. Then the different ways. So the shakers did evolve. They're not stuck in time. And so even though a lot of what we look at are 1980s, you know, that's a sewing machine on the right. And yet over here, 1825, Elizabeth Spaulding, this is her sampler. And they have a, a great collection of samplers at uh, Pleasant Hill. Here's our iconic shaker boxes with a timepiece. I threw that in for a little symbolism. <laughs> and then a hand carved bowl that would have been like a bread bowl, most likely something like that and from the kitchen. Quite beautiful. These are items from the infirmary. Um, Penna, well now, Pennebaker um, was a, both, there was a Pennebaker that was the doctor and a Pennebaker that was the dentist for um, Pleasant Hill that we know of. On the left, you have your, um, well, it is actually a wheelchair. 
all the way in the back right corner, I'm not sure if you can see it, there's a wheel. <laughs> You know, so I don't know if I had a broken leg, whether I'd want anybody wheeling me around in that, but that was their wheelchair. Oops, let me get back. And to the right, you have the uh, ceramic, which they would not have made, but they would have gotten from the world's people on a chair or on a table that they did make. This is some of the medicinal bottles and books on medicine that are in the collection. I like to show this one because that broken one at the top was actually an alcohol bottle, not the rubbing kind, <laughs> the drinking kind. So I'm going to guess that would have been during Prohibition-ish times, maybe late 1800s. And Wolfbane, I don't know if anybody knows about Wolfbane, but I wouldn't have a whole lot of that. The shoes, again, like I said, seem so personal to me. This is a shoe last where they would have made the shoes on this. And this is a man size 42. So any of you guys want to <laughs> check that out. Um, but I just thought this is a good example of function that to me was just very graceful. A brother's hat, vest, shirt, typical wear of the times with his straw hat and the iconic shaker chair. One of the um, sisters, and I don't remember which one it is, I don't think it was Mary Settles, said something along the lines, I'm not quoting this exactly, uh, you know, I guess one day I'll be remembered as a chair. <laughs> So I was a little surprised to find a top hat inside the collections, you know, given their emphasis on simplicity and not owning fancy things. But here I can sort of project my imagination. And what my imagination tells me is that the brother had his normal straw hat, but he had a fancy hat because they had to do business with the world's people. They had a lot of industries, you know, that's how they kept themselves going. You know, they sold chairs, they sold brooms, they sold jellies, they sold seeds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, wool, silk. Silk was a big deal at Pleasant Hill. Um, and so I'm thinking, you know, you have to dress the part, right? So that was his bit. That would have been the brother's or the brethren's um, business hat. Another basket. This one, again, somebody started to take credit or ownership. I'm not sure what with the pH. And then the lone bucket. So the buckets fascinated me because they're really colorful. And you're going, yeah, well, that's great, Carol, but this is black and white. Well, so this gives me an opportunity to talk about two things. One, the shakers loved color and the colors were symbolic. So like blue is heaven, you know, but these buckets are red and yellow. They're blue, they're gold. I mean, they're white. And so I, the buckets put me in a little bit of a quandary when it came to how am I going to present the collections? Because digitally I photograph in color. And so there they all are, these beautiful buckets. And, but I really wanted an essence. I didn't want the eye to be distracted by color, even though color was important. I wanted the essence, the bones, the just what it is to show. And I feel like black and white does that best. So our buckets are in black and white. But the color is amazing and it is absolutely worth it to visit Pleasant Hill with the idea in mind that you're going to look for color. For a photographer, you know, you're paying attention to light and texture and geometry and color is just another element, you know. So to get to the essence, you, you know, you kind of want to get rid of as much color as you can. But it is worth it to go look at the village, look at the doors, look just look at the color at, at uh, Pleasant Hill. Um, but that's why everything is in black and white. 
but the buckets fascinated me. There's another example. This probably is a red, a yellow, a green, and a blue bucket. I shouldn't tease you that way. These are also gorgeous buckets <laughs> in, in black and white. And the handles would be different colors. Okay, although most of the hardware was not made at Shaker Village, some of it was, but I wanted to show how the village was sort of interdependent with the world's people. You know, they, they were as self-sufficient as they could be, but you, you know, cannot be absolutely isolated. And so they not only sold their wares, but they also bought, right? And so I would guess that the doorknobs they didn't make, but there are like the um, um, hinges at the bottom that probably they made themselves. You can almost see the hand hammering there. The silk industry was a big deal at Pleasant Hill. Um, the collection holds several beautiful, colorful, delicate handkerchiefs. The work at Pleasant Hill was so fine that the New England shakers bought from Pleasant Hill rather than try to emulate them. They just thought, well, we're too crude. We'll just buy it from them. <laughs> Shaker sifters, which looks like the box, but has the sifter part in the bottom, the screen in the bottom, which would have been found in the kitchen. Classic shaker pegs, all kinds of pegs. You know, I always thought the pegs were just pegs, right? But they're screws, they're short, they're long, and they're colorful. The broom industry, of course, was a big deal. These are not original brooms. The poor original brooms, you don't want to handle them because they're very, very fragile. Um, but these are examples of the types that would have been made at uh, Pleasant Hill. To the left, we call that the good rug because they believe it says good. I don't know. <laughs> but it's the good rug. Um, and they have examples of at least five or six different designs um, of rugs. The image to the right, again, I'm trying to show how the, the cabinetry and some a lot of the furniture was built in for specific purposes, built into the wall, and that's uh, in the infirmary. You know, it wouldn't be a photograph of Shaker Village if it didn't have upside down chairs on a peg. In fact, there's a stamp on my book. If you take the paper cover off, there's a stamp of that. That's how iconic it is. They stamped it. I just fell in love with the chairs. I'm sorry. I don't mean to remember the shakers as a chair, but I loved the chairs. I loved how light they were. I mean, it was unbelievable. I loved how thin they were. This is one that was in kind of bad shape in terms of the paint. Um, but it was a beautiful chair. And this was my favorite. This was so light. You really had the sensation that if you sneezed, it would fall over. And Becky says, you really have a thing for that chair. <laughs> but I loved it. It was amazing. It was amazing. So there it is in the meeting house with meeting house light, worship light. So let's do a little bit of the exteriors here. This is a barn. Back in 2017, I did a book on agricultural heritage, and it was Kentucky Barns. And I photographed several of the uh, Pleasant Hill barns. Uh, and this was a corn crib, actually. Um, but it stands there and typically has livestock around it. I think now it may have sheep, goats. I'm not sure. But sometimes it has horses, you know. Uh, and in the distance, you can see some of the um, West family buildings. The Shakers love symmetry and order and perfection. Becky sometimes felt that I didn't, put, she didn't like it when I messed the pegs around. She said, oh no, they wouldn't have liked that. Yeah. So this is an example of the side door of the center family dwelling, um, the three doors and the three lights. 
the East Family Brethren House. So you see that they use plank and they use brick and then they use limestone. And the cistern house and the brethren bathhouse. So if you go around to the side of the little one, it, there's a door you can go in and there's pegs uh, for you to hang your, if you're a brethren, to hang your towels and you just take your shower in there. I'm like, this looks very cold. The cistern, there's a cistern at the top of the cistern house, which is amazing, but unbelievably difficult to photograph. So you won't see that. These are both black and white films from the 1990s. The one on the right is the corn hay uh, that they used in the reenactments of making brooms at the time. And so they'd set the, the stuff up in the window. And the one on the left was a gate to nowhere. But I loved it because somehow it makes you imagine. So what did this go to, right? Because there are steps up to it. One of the things about photography that I like is, is it, its ability to freeze time in a way. So these two images are actually historic images because they don't do living history anymore. And I'm not certain that gate is there. I think the gate's gone. It's just the steps. So I love that about photography is you can take an image and it's current. And for me, it didn't seem like that long ago, but it was the 1990s. It's now, you know, a relic. It, it shows relics. This is also a film image. It, I think those trees are not there and the big firs are not there anymore. This is a digital image, the center family dwelling. And I just, you get to see just the beauty of it in the landscape, which is something that um, I think we need to pay a little bit more attention to is not just the buildings, but the buildings in the landscape. And this tree is what makes this image, the shadow of the tree. Now we're gonna move to the interiors. Everybody's seen pictures of Shaker stairs, but let me tell you what happened to me. So I'm wandering around during COVID when there's nobody there trying to figure out how in the world am I going to show dance and song? And I'm walking around in the trustees, you know, getting my uh, picture of the lemons. And I suddenly realized as I looked at the stairs that if you really pay attention and you let your imagination go, the stairs are dancing. They're spiraling up. They could even be song. You know, they go up. They come down the other side. So I put together six images of stairs that I took uh, and presented it to uh, a photo magazine with that metaphor, and they loved it. So I got it right. <laughs> now, I don't know if you're going to feel song or dance as you look at the images, uh, but that's what was going on with me as I photographed these. This is as you walk into Center Family. Whoops, you don't, can't see my cursor. <laughs> this is as you walk into Center Family dwelling. Of course, the brethren up one side and the sisters up the other. And this is at the top of the trustees. And this one's just called Ascension. Okay, the ceiling in the uh, center family, I think the second floor, um, is, is of architectural and structural note, the, the way it arches. I love the movement of the arches throughout the building and the, the circularness of it too. Look in the next image. Right. You've all if you've been to the third floor and the trustees all the way to the top, you know, here's the ceiling and then it arches up in it has this big circle like a big skylight. That's this. And then there's pegs, which I'm not really sure who could get up there 
saying something, but I'm thinking maybe it was lights. I'm not sure. So again, there's still lots of room. I mean, Becky probably could tell me if I asked her, but it's still lots of room for imagination. And I think that's what's important. The interesting thing is this dome is not visible from the outside. I don't think it is, is it, Bob? No. This is the geometry of the interiors. Again, arches. Well, I can't get it to advance here. There it is. This is the meeting house from the top of the center family dwelling. So, you know, as a photographer, you make a fool of yourself often. So if you go to where, uh, to the very top of center family dwelling, where the, the one of those images where I showed you where the built-in drawers are, there's another set of stairs that if you go up, goes to a locked door, it's glass, that you can see this image. And it's like, so, you know, there's a photographer on their tippy toes with their nose smashed up against the glass with the camera trying to get this shot at sunset. This is the image that we used for the, the reverse side of it for the cover of the book. Lots of folks have photographed how it goes down, not just how it goes up. What I was lucky enough to get was the fact that there's artificial light now, which there wasn't in the 90s. If you didn't have natural light, you wouldn't have gotten those shadows like I got. And so there are advantages to advancement. <laughs> All right, this is the end. Thank you for watching. This is one of the shaker chairs looking down. They were very unique in their arms, and I appreciate your attention. I'm open for questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carol. Um, now you all know what happens. We're going to do Q&A, and I'll come around with the mic so that our folks online can also hear the questions. I'll start us off. We already have one in the chat. It's a funny one. If shakers were not attached to things, what would be the need for keys and locks? Oh, I love that. Isn't it good? It's a good one. Well, they still had to make a living. <laughs> you hate it when somebody walks off with your horse. <laughs> Yeah, most of the locks were not like lock your bedroom. Most of them were like, you know, uh, what you would have had on a barn or a shed or that kind of stuff, you know. Not attached to it, but not giving it away. Other questions? Really? Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm a shaker novice, so. Okay. Two questions. What you kept referring to the world's people. You. <laughs> Are you finished? Is that the end of that? Is that the end of that answer? And why were the chairs hung upside down? Okay. So the world's people are people who were not part of the Shaker community. Um, and in the Shaker community, the women and the men were separate. You know, it was a utopian community. Um, the world's people were people like us that were not um, believers. The chairs are upside down. I don't really wonder who started that, but they put it upside down. The pegs are there to turn, you know, you, they hung as much stuff as they could on the pegs. It helped with cleaning, made it much simpler. So, yes. I really invite you to go out to Pleasant Hill. They have tons and tons of, um, you know, interactive, you know, not just things to read like I did when I was six, but there's interactive things. They have an app that you can walk up to and sort of scan the QR code and it'll tell you about what you're looking at and give you more information. I mean, it's, and it is so beautiful out there. It is just beautiful. So, okay. 
So I'm old enough to remember when they did the living history kinds of things in Shaker right. Village, and I have family in Danville. And I'm wondering, of the kind of work that the Shakers did in terms of their craftsmanship, are there groups of people who have inherited or adopted that kind of craftsmanship and have some kind of um, spiritual or craftsman relationship with that heritage? Well, that's a very good question. And I'm going to make a guess at the answer. And Bob, you can speak up or Zach, if you know. Um, I don't know that they handed it down unless someone was part of the community. Like, for example, I know up in New England, there are still a few, and I don't know how many Shakers, but they're new converts, you know, um, because there for a while there were no Shakers and there were Shakers, that kind of thing. And I do know that the New England uh, Shakers were still practicing the crafts and that there were some people, and this would have been back in the 90s, I'm thinking. Um, there were some people learning those crafts. Now, there are lots of craftsmen who have not learned from the Shakers, but have practiced, especially like the boxes and chairs. Like over the decades, I was in Berea for a while, and there was a fella in Berea who did amazing chairs, and he did the boxes. There is a gentleman that when I've been out at the um, visitor center, the welcome center in, at uh, Pleasant Hill, that you know, like at Christmas, he'll be out there making boxes and they sell boxes out there. I haven't seen anybody making chairs recently and baskets. That's right. They're, they have a, that's exactly right. There's, they have a, a upcoming demonstration and there's some material over where my three books are. Uh, <laughs> there's some material <laughs> too now, okay. Um, there's some material over there that, that tells about the events coming at Shaker Village this fall. And one of them is someone showing the woodcraft. But so there are people who are doing it, but I wouldn't say that it was handed down. Right. Yeah. We have another one from the chat. I find it interesting that they make their staircases spiral. Do you think that structurally it was easier to build? No. <laughs> no, I don't think so. My understanding, and again, I'm not a historian and I may be misspeaking completely, but my understanding is that those staircases are amazing structurally, architecturally. Um, they're noteworthy. Errol. Hello. <laughs> so my question, um, where where my attention gravitated towards in your work was the particular calling out of the um, the initials on the, that, and and you you made it a point to to point, point it out that mm -hmm. you know they that normally didn't belong there. So there was this contrast of kind of conservatism within the culture but then also this freedom of expression in your work, freedom of expression with the staircase, freedom of expression with the um, the initials. Uh, was there an intentionality of like putting that on the top out of that column of- When I photographed it? Yeah. Yeah, because it was the it... smallest. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was the only intentionality. You know, you bring up a good point of how I, you know, sort of talked about those that did like put their initials on a scarf or a glove or a box. You know, over time, again, the shakers evolved. And so during the Victorian times, if you look at some of the old pictures of the Victorian shaker rooms, they're kind of fancy. Um, like there's a picture hanging and there's a mirror and, you know, it was, it had gone beyond like 250, you know, 200 years earlier when it was a lot more, I'm not going to say puritanical, but it was a lot more rigid. It was a lot more simple and the simplicity was enforced. Um, you start to see, and I think the New Englanders thought the Kentucky Shakers were a little rogue, <laughs> You know, I mean, you know, they did not see the perfectionism in some of our crafts um, that they expected out of their folks up in their societies. 
But, um, you know, human nature is human nature. Leave it to the Kentuckians to put their own spin on it. <laughs> As I understand it, during the Civil War, they uh, lost a lot of their supplies due uh -huh. to uh, soldiers. Yep. Do you know very much about that? What I know about that is that um, they didn't turn anybody away. And so both Confederate and Union troops ate there, used their food, camped, and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know all the specifics of it, but I know vaguely what you you know. I mean, basically, it really kind of wiped them out, you know, because they didn't turn anybody away. Ten thousand soldiers came through um, there the road there, and they were um, feeding them, you know, and they wouldn't take any pay. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. I hear so many people say, oh, the Shakers didn't make it because they were celibate. And it's like, well, if that were true, we wouldn't have any monks and we wouldn't have any nuns, right? The Shakers had problems because as industry changed, they had to keep up with it. And because of things like having their resources wiped out, um, so, you know, why the Shakers are, are not around doesn't have anything to do um, with the fact that the men stayed on one side and the women stayed on the other side. It has to do with economics and resources. Right. So I'm trying to think visually. Okay. <laughs> um, about, because that's what your, your, your focus was. And the question I have, and the thing I was struck, one of the things I was struck by in photographs is the fact that there were some, and it's mostly in the architectural spaces, there were some architectural spaces like in the meeting room that are strictly linear, you know, mm -hmm. like this room, for right. example, pretty much That's straight true. corners, straight walls, That's true. that sort of thing. And there were other um, elements in spaces where, and the stairs a little bit like that, where but it, it was just lovely curvature, almost mm -hmm. cloud like a lot of arcs and, and hardly any straight, straight columns kind of thing. I just wondered if, did you see any, um, did you see any reasons for why it was curvature, such lovely curvature in some spaces while it was sort of dogmatic lines in another? Was there a relationship there or did you remark on it? I think it probably had more to do with when the building was built and who the architect was. Like I know, I believe, I don't know. I believe the architect that did Center Family, which had the, the arcs and all the, you know, the doorways had the beautiful arcs and the one that did the trustees building, I think that was the same architect. Was that the same architect? Yeah. So, so you, you see a lot of that. Those were also built much later than the earlier ones are going to be much more simple. In fact, the earliest Shaker building, which doesn't stand anymore, was a log house, you know, so again, you get to see sort of an evolution even of their architecture. Uh, as you walk around. But that's a great question. That's a great question. Because it is true, the meeting house is very, you know, linear. I have a question about, have you had an opportunity or even an interest in looking uh, at South Union and, and maybe making a comparison with your photographs to see what, what you see down there? Right. So I've visited South Union, but it's been a while. Mm -hmm. There was a fellow whose name I can't think of who photographed South Union and did a lot of color photographs. It's a, it's a big tome. Um, I have thought about going to South Union and photographing their collections. The last time I was there was probably 10 years ago. And everything was out in a room kind of, it wasn't a living history, but it was all exposed, right? Um, or laid out. Since then, my understanding is they bought a building that uh, a private company owned and wouldn't give up for a while. And now I think South Union has been able to buy it. Um, so th it's worth it. I mean, it's something that I thought about. You know, the only thing that stops me is how far away it is. Yeah. 
So South, Kentucky had two Shaker villages. One is at Pleasant Hill, which all these images come from at south side of Danville. And the other one is South Union, which is near Bowling Green. Yes, sir. Yep. I'm, I'm wondering if you've uh, given any thought to photographing the cemetery. What about this? I'm sorry, I didn't. Yes, I did. It's in the book. <laughs> So that same evening when I got the, the shakers dancing on the trees, um, the light was just gorgeous. And I was able to get not too macabre looking photograph of the, uh, of the graveyard, but it's, it's in the book. Yeah. Okay. We have one last question from the chat and then that'll be the last one for the evening. Cause we're coming right up on seven o'clock. What we're drew, punctual, real punctual here. Get you in and out. What drew you to the Shakers and what's next for you? So what drew me to the Shakers was walking onto the, the village, Shaker Village uh, campus and saying, oh my goodness, having the deja vu back to my childhood in Colonial Williamsburg. So that, then I did do some reading and some studying and, and I was very taken by Thomas Merton's writings and um, understandings of them. You know, he very much emphasized the uh, work is worship and heaven on earth. Uh, now, Becky likes to, Becky Souls, the curator, likes to make fun of me. She says, oh, I'm sure when they were sawing away that they were praying. And I was like, well, maybe. <laughs> so she likes to give me a hard time. But that's what drew me originally. What's next for me, I'm not really certain. At this point, I'm very interested in um, built environment and um, on a natural environment. You know, for a while I was thinking about gardens, um, but I'm more interested in landscape and how our 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 heritage on the land is. And I'm not sure what that's going to look like. You know, I start with these very vague concepts, and they eventually narrow themselves into something. Uh, I have thought about. Um, actually photographing swampland in West, Western Kentucky because it's a natural heritage sites over there and it's beautiful. So I'm not really sure what will happen next. One more round of applause for Carol. Thank you so much.